black will a tree. Some folks say she was no good, but she's all right. She's all right with me. She's all right, she's all right. Okay. Yeah, what now? Okay. Oh. Okay. That'll, that'll work. to Mr. Leo Bud Welch. Uh, go ahead, have a seat. And um, we're gonna explore the blues today. All right. <sighs> Is that chair okay? Because I know it can be kind of tricky. You keep your legs up there if you need to stabilize. And then we're gonna lose the cups in just a second. What'd you say? Count to ten. Uh, count to ten. Count to ten. Uh huh. Just count one. Oh yeah. Okay. No, just talk like you go normally talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and just talk to me like you would normally talk to me. Okay. What's all this on here? Like, just tell me about this microphone. What's going on with this microphone right here? I don't know. I don't want to get it right. So I know, right? There's something going on with it. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but there's something going on. I don't want to. I don't want to get it right for me. <laughs> Okay, and I want a picture. Could you do me a picture while we're at some point? Uh, huh? Okay, I got, yeah, I figured that. Here, I need you to take a picture of us while we're on set. Uh, just from wherever you are in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just don't trip over nothing. Don't trip over nothing, I said. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, how is his height? Should he come up some in his chair? He fine. Okay, you good. You good. I don't want to slide around the ball. <laughs> slide it more this way. Okay. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nobody else in the room, okay? Yes, yes. All right, so that's how we're going to do this. Yes. Now, is there anything that you really wanted to talk about that's specific? Yes, what I really want to talk about is uh, 
I've been playing guitar ever since I was about 13 years old. And uh, I watched my first cousin play guitar, and I watched him and learned how to play myself, me and his baby brother. Mm -hmm. His name was R. Lundis West. The one that learned me how to, really how to play guitar was, his name was R. C. West, one of my first cousins. And he sold garden seed and all a right. guitar. So you're going to tell me all of the details of that, and I want you to talk just the way you're talking right now. Okay. So we're going to talk about how you started, mm -hmm. and then a little bit about where you're from, and, yeah. and being that you're from Bruce, and how you grew up, you know, on the... Welcome to Delta Renaissance. I'm your host, Sade Turnipseed, and I am truly, truly honored and pleased to have with me a legend. He is. He's truly a legend. He's one of the true authentic blues men. And this is Leo Bud Welch, all the way from Bruce, Mississippi. Right. And I just want to welcome you to the studio today and to Greenville, Mississippi. And I'm just so honored. God bless him. To God. have you here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, and I am glad to be here today in the studio with y'all. And I am the old Bud West Senior. And I'm giving the name the Legion of the Blues, the oldest man that's playing the blues around now in the state of Mississippi. Wow. So I was born in a place they call Sabogla, Mississippi, in Calhoun County. In Calhoun County. In Calhoun County. I was born on a farm. Well, my daddy was a chill cropper, one while, and then you got the renting, renting land, making a crop. I grew up the hard way. I came up, you know, plant mules, picking cotton, feeding the chickens, feeding the hogs. I'd go to the hog pen before I go to school every morning and slop the hogs and just raise up on a farm. It was sort of like in back in the slavery days. So. We never knew nothing but work and go to school and come back home and eat and lay down and go to bed and get up the next morning and get ready for school. So my first cousin, R.C. West, I ordered him my guitar, a cushy guitar. And so he started playing and he said he wasn't, didn't want me and his brother to fool around with his guitar. But whenever he'd go off, we was a young boy, we'd be at the house, so we would grab the guitar and go to playing and banging on it. So <laughs> he came in one afternoon or one night, we were sitting there playing the guitar. And he said, I thought I told you boys not to mess with my guitar. Mm -hmm. But he said, I ain't going to say nothing else about y'all playing the guitar because y'all playing better than I am. <laughs> and so I've been playing ever since. I used to play, we had a school party mm -hmm. for the school. In them days, back in the day, we called it dialogue. It was something like, you know, like a movie show, or like have an interview with you here now. Mm -hmm. And I'd go, we called it field days back in them days. We'd 
go to the high school, and I would sing, sit around on the hood of a car, and people would be gathered around me. And some of them said, who is that little old boy that played that guitar? My teacher said, that's my boy. And y'all ain't going to bother him. They ain't going to give him either. And so I went to playing. During that, and then they encouraged me to go to playing some in the church. But I went out on the road. The first thing I went out playing was blues. Now, how old were you when you first really started playing for the schools? And Fifteen years old. Okay. And that was in about the year, I believe, of 1945. Now, I want to back up a little bit and talk a little bit more about that farm life, you know, that growing up on the, on the farm. And, and that's interesting to me because I, um, as you may know, I'm working on uh, this project to build a monument for, uh, that pays homage and honors cotton pickers, or people who planted, chopped, and picked cotton here in the Mississippi Delta, but throughout the South. So I want to hear from you someone who grew up that way, yes. what was picking cotton all about? What, what was that life, if you could explain it to well, us? Well, picking cotton was a hard job for me. It's something I never could do. Of course, I mean, I wouldn't pick much. I picked 100 pounds of cotton and a half a day. I was doing some real work. And that wasn't much? you saying that that wasn't much? That was a lot, wasn't it? That was too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, my sister and them, they picked 200 pounds, 250 pounds a day. And meanwhile, they picked more than I would because they grab stalk, bowl, cotton, and all and put them in the sack. <laughs> trying to get the weight. And I'm not trying to, like I'm washing dishes, and I'm trying to pick all the bowls and stuff, trying to keep it clean. We have a sack full of cotton, and we have a full for a sack full. Uh -huh. I never could pick much cotton. We weren't getting much, get about 50 cents for 100 pounds. 50 cents for 100 pounds. 100 so pounds of cotton. So that half a day would get you 50 cents? Uh, half a day, 50 cents. And so, well, I went playing mules, mm -hmm. middle busters, turning players, turning the all over for 50 cents a day. I worked five days, I have two, fifty. Uh, two dollars and fifty cents in a week. I thought I had good week. money then. Was it really? I mean, did was it really good money or it just? It, it was good money. It was time, good money. Cause everything you could, you get a sack of flour for about twenty five cents. Five pound of flour. Okay. Five pound of sugar for about twenty five cents. And. But you couldn't. How much would a pair of shoes cost? So. How much what? A pair of shoes. Oh, we get a pair of shoes for about a dollar. Oh, really? A dollar a pair. Okay. And we never did get them, but them old, I call them Bogan shoes with the high top to them. <laughs> <laughs> I went to school, we'll cut off overalls and things, you know. I walked a mile and a half from where I see to the school. Yeah. And then when you went shopping, it wasn't like today where the kids and everybody has malls and shopping uh, department stores and all that, but you shopped and the, the store that was on I, the was store. In the country store. In the country store. store. Mm -hmm. I remember every winter when we had a, my daddy would have a settlement with the land, mm -hmm. sit on the farm. We'd, we'd walk about eight miles to a place from Sabogli to call Slay Spring. Well, he was a dry goods store over there. He'd go over there to buy one of clothes. Mm -hmm. And that's, so I would walk the store with him every winter and we'd get our clothes. But most of the time, after having the settlement, he had to borrow money from the boss man to get our clothes and stuff for the winter and to buy food for the winter. So explain what the settlement was. What, what's, what's the settlement? So explain which one? The settlement. What is the settlement? Well, the settlement was, uh, see, all down through the years while we're farming, they, they would buy fertilizer and put on, put on the road, you know, run a and put the fertilizer, that's to help the cotton and stuff grow, corn. Mm -hmm. And they had to pay for half of that. Because you were and sharecropping, so you had to pay half. Half of that for the fertilizer yeah. and all that. Okay. And time, time they settled up for the settlement, when the time come the settlement, we would unpick and gather the crop. And then they'd go to the boss man to get the settlement. They wouldn't have nothing. That's what you call a settlement. And that's the payment at the end of the year. You have worked the whole year, right? And wet and wouldn't have nothing. 
We're going to get ready to take a quick break and come back, but I really want to talk more about that and how it made you feel to have to work your whole family out there in the field working, and yeah. then when it came time to get paid at the end of the year, yeah. you would have nothing. So we'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome back. I am in the studio today talking to a lovely gentleman by the name of Leo Bud Welsh. And, you know, we left off talking about life on the farm, but then life as a sh sharecropper and the whole thing about um, the settlement at the end of the year, which is a huge controversy. You know, it's like who kept the books and how much were you being charged throughout the year? Uh, when it came time to balance the accounts for, you know, what your family may have consumed and then what you've also picked and, and should have made a profit for, it would generally always come out where the family didn't make anything, yeah. right? So talk to us about that. And, 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 but first tell us, how many people were in your family? Well, it was, because I had half sisters and half brothers. But at that time, one before in our family, okay. it was me and my twin sister. Her name was Cleo, and I had two more sisters. We all had the same mother. They were in the family. We all worked in the field together from sun up to sundown. Mm. We couldn't see when we'd go out there, and we couldn't see when we'd leave, because it'd be dark we'd go out, dark when we'd come back. And so when they're speaking about that a settlement, and like when they settled up for the year of work, we had nothing. My dad would have to borrow more money to make it back down through the years after paying for foot lines and different things. And I remember I have a water and bread. Just, I be mean, so hungry, I have to just crumble bread up in water and eat water like I'd eat milk and bread. Mm -hmm. And we had a big meal when we got a milk and bread dinner. That was a good meal. Milk, corn. And we raised up on black-eyed peas and turnip greens. That was all raised on the farm. That's and one good thing about manager. the farm, we could raise a lot of that food on the farm, like sweet potatoes, iced potatoes, tomatoes, peanuts, and all that. That's badly what kept us living by you know, being able to raise that. Mm -hmm. But coming up on the farm, I tell anybody it was hard. It was hard for me, and I know it was hard for my family, too, because then we were trying to go to school and get up early every morning, get breakfast, and go to school and come back from school, pull off our clothes and go in the field, start picking cotton. And one thing was really hard on me, they called it horn cotton with a hoe. I never could do that. I have like to cut my feet off sometimes trying to chop grass out of cotton, you know. Mm. And that's pretty dangerous with a hole to get them real short. Yeah. And I never could pick much cotton because it seemed like it hurt my back, like my back hurt the day. You know? just <laughs> wasn't <laughs> I never could pick much cotton. Now, you, you mentioned going to school. Uh, was it also 
true for you that they would insist that everybody, especially all the black kids, they would all have to go to um, the fields and the schools would be shut down? Yeah, that's right. We all had to go to go to the field after we got out of school. Sometimes we couldn't eat our supper fast enough to get to the field before we get sundown so we could work in the field. Oh, but they did allow you to go to school. I mean, school was. We'd okay. go to school and okay. school lab would go back to the field and mm -hmm. work. Okay. But Bruce is not in the Delta, is it? It's not in the Delta. Okay. That's in the hill. Yeah. Yeah. But I've been working down at Sabola. It was. We had low land, they called flat land, you know, and mm -hmm. we worked that land, raised cotton, sometimes four or five bales a year like that, get paid for ginning the cotton. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to pay for ginning the cotton. They sell the cotton so you wouldn't get much out of that. Mm -hmm. So it was a poor living coming up so now down through the years. The blues that you were inspired to sing, did it, did it kind of reflect how you felt as, you know, coming up, picking yeah, cotton? That, 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 that's what uplifted, uh, uplifted me. When I started singing the blues, I'd go out and sing the blues. I'd make more little money. They'd give me a dollar, two, five or six dollars. Have a cup out there throwing money in the cup. I have more money when I go home than I was working on the farm. My mother would tell me, boy, you ain't got no business out there playing them blues. I said, Mom, I got to do something for life. <laughs> so I went to plan for picnics around Horse Pan, a place to call Horse Pan. Mm -hmm. Owens McCain used to give a three day picnic. Me and, me and my cousin always say the one I learned how to play from. We play, play three nights a week when they had a picnic in the, about the month of July mm -hmm. after the poor. Yeah. Did you write we, any of your music yourself? Yeah, I wrote a few songs. Mm -hmm. Song like a. Walked down so many turn moves, and I wrote a song about. Of course, somebody else got the same title. I, I write a song about baby, please don't go, but I heard somebody else have it out. But I wrote a few songs, and well, I, I like the music by playing. I just play, start playing by ear, but now I know every key. A, B, C. Whatever you want to go to. And you're well, self taught, you taught yourself how to do it, right? Yeah, I taught myself how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I start off playing by ear, you know. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is hear somebody sing a song, I find the key to get with them what key is in. But I can't play no music, somebody singing in one key and, and somebody playing on another. And that music looks like it do something to me. I like for all to be, you know, combining together. And that's what to make, make music sound great. Then later on down through the years, I was getting about 18 years. Well, I, I, I went to Grenada to sign up for some books to go to high school, but wasn't able to handle that. So that's when I went to work and went to really playing the blues then. And, but later on down through the year, they kept asking me about playing for the church. Mm -hmm. So I started singing, playing gospel songs in the church. Mm -hmm. And we had a well, we had a choir, but when we get ready to go somewhere with the pastor, part of the pastor, the choir wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. And me and my sister and my sister-in-law, we would go. And so in our church, Sabogla, I give us the name, I call it Leo West and the Sabogla Voices. Well, you so, know, we're going to take another quick break, but when we come back, we're going to listen to Leo West solo. Now, if you can please, please just think about uh, the, the typical Leo Welch sound. What is that? Is it blues? Is it gospel? Is it a combination of the two? But, you know, think about that. But when we come back, we're going to yeah. be treated to a very, very special performance yeah. by the authentic blues man, Mr. Leo Bud Welch. So come on back.
Welcome back. And ladies and gentlemen, it is truly my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Leo Bud Welch. <laughs> Yeah. 